Um, interestingly, nine years ago today, uh, Lisa and I went on our first date. And uh, we, before I moved to Ottawa, before we got married, obviously, uh, we were in a long-distance relationship. And uh, we'd both get up in the morning, you know, we'd go to our day jobs, and then we'd come home. And then we'd spend hours, hours talking on the phone. And, and I had some roommates at the time, and so most times I would go in my room, I'd close the door so I didn't have any distractions, and I could just spend time with her. And uh, I was better looking in those days, of course, because she couldn't see me. And, uh, but that's kind of, we did that for an entire year. Our, our, we lived a, you know, a long distance relationship. And some of you can relate to that. You remember those times where you used to talk to that special someone on the phone? Remember that? And the, and the telephone had this super long cord. And you'd take the phone all the way down the hall to your room, and then you'd close the door, and you'd spend hours talking to that person on the phone. Remember how cute you were? It was like, no, you hang up. No, you hang up. No, you hang up. Remember that? And you talk to someone on the phone, and you talk for so long that eventually you got to the point where there was just this dead silence on the phone until someone would speak up and say this, what do you want to talk about? You remember that? There, there would just be this awkward silence. There would be the lull in the conversation, and someone would speak up and say, what do you want to talk about? What do you want to talk about? It's a great question. I mean, what do you want to talk about beyond, you know, what did you do today? Because you can spend a lot of time talking about nothing, right? You ever notice that on the phone? It's like, what's new? Nothing. You know, how's the weather? What did you do today? What did you have for lunch? I mean, what do you want to talk about? It, that question's really revealing because what you're asking is, do you have anything worth talking about? I, I mean, beyond the monotony of day-to-day -day living that consumes the most of our time and most of our energies, I mean, do you have anything that you really want to talk about? Is there something on your mind? Is there something on your heart? Is there something that you want to see happen in and through your life? Or is maybe there something you want to see God do in and through your life? I mean, what do you want to talk about? Do you really have anything we're talking about? What? It's, it's a great question. It's a great question because if we're not careful, if you're not careful, if I'm not careful, we'll just go day to day. We'll just go day to day, typical to typical, update to update in our conversations. And we'll never be working on, thinking about, dreaming about, or even praying about anything that's big enough that gets us excited enough to actually want or have to talk about it. I mean, what do you want to talk about? I mean, is there something big? Is there something grand? Is there something in your life more than what you had for lunch and what's new? And am I going to get over the flu? And am I gonna, is she going to call me back? And am I going to get over this deal? Am I going to make that deal? Am I going to get through this opportunity? Am I going to push that idea? Like, is there anything that's like, that consumes your mind and consumes your heart that's so big you're like, man, I, I just can't help myself but talk about it? Is there something that's so important to you that it keeps there from being a lull in the conversation or that dead silence in the conversation? You just have to talk about it? Or are you like most of the rest of us, that we don't really have anything going on? Now, I recognize today is going to irritate some of you because this question, what do you want to talk about, it forces us to look in the mirror and face the hard reality that for many of us, we don't have anything we're talking about. We're not working on anything new. Right? We're just working on getting through the week. I'm just worried about surviving time change Sunday. I'm just worrying about getting through the winter. And I'm hoping that they'll call back. Or I'm hoping that th this deal will close. But in terms of big and grand and something new and something different, I, I, don't, I don't really have anything new or something really that important to talk about. What do you want to talk about? So what I want to do for the rest of our time together this morning is take this question, what do you want to talk about? And I want to switch it up just a little bit and ask you this question. What do you want to talk to God about? What do you want to talk to God about? We've been saying throughout the series, if you're jumping in for the first time with us today, we've been saying through the series that the telephone is to our relationships with people what prayer is to our relationship with God. And that every single one of us in this room have been given this amazing opportunity to dial and connect with our Heavenly Father through this amazing yet from time to time frustrating thing called prayer. And if you were to look, if you were to be honest and look at your prayers over the last few months or even the last year, if you're anything like most people who believe in God, my guess is that your prayers could be summed up with the monotony of life, the day-to-day -day of life. Not much is new, not much is different, but help me, bless me, keep me, help me get over this flu, help her to call me back, help me to get over this deal, I pray that this thing closes, you know. But in terms of big and grand and these things that are just, you know, 
holding on to your heart and holding on to your mind, there really isn't anything. And the prayers that you pray are pretty much consumed with help me, bless me, keep me, guide me, keep them safe and get me out of this. And hopefully this will happen and get watch over the flu and this and that. Hopefully, you know, the coronavirus or whatever doesn't come to me. And, and that's really essentially the gist of your prayers. So what do you want to talk to God about? I mean, not only do we pray about those things that are the day-to-day monotony of life things, those are the things, let's be honest, those are the things that we worry about. Those are the things that we stress about. Those are the things that really, if we were all honest, that's all we've got to talk about. And it's interesting. Jesus said it this way in Matthew chapter 6. He talked about this idea this way, and I want to read you what he said. It says, Jesus is talking. He says, so do not worry saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? And I don't know exactly how we said it, but that's kind of the idea. And he says this, for the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. So he's like, look, you, you spend so much time thinking about and stressing about, you spend so much time worrying about, you know, who's going to be there and what are you going to do and if that deal's going to close and where, what are you going to wear and what are you going to eat, what are you going to have to drink? It's like, why do you spend so much time worrying about, why do you spend so much time chasing after these things? Chasing after things and worrying about things, stressing about things that people who don't even believe in God worry and stress about. Why would you live as someone who believes in God? Why would you live your life that way? Why would you stress? Why would you worry about these things that Jesus would say, I believe, that for the most part are just going to work themselves out anyways? I mean, why would you stress and worry? Why would you spend so much time praying about things that for the most part are just going to work out? Why are you so worried? Why are you living in a way that people who don't even believe in God live? Why would you do that? He says, you should be different. So he says this. He says, it's interesting. But seek first. That means be consumed with. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So be consumed with his kingdom and his righteousness. But if you were to have a pie chart of all your prayers over the last few months or even the last year, if you're anything like me, the biggest piece of that pie would be filled up with things that for the most part would just work themselves out anyways. And it's as if God is saying in these moments, you know, look, let's just be honest. If you were to take all those things, if I could just speak for God for a moment, if, I, if we could just take all those things and pile them all up in one big pile, and if I didn't answer any prayers related to any of those things, aren't most of those things just going to kind of work themselves out anyways? Yeah? Okay, so do you really want to spend another year of your life coming to God with just that? Isn't there something bigger? Isn't there something grander? Isn't there something bigger or grander that you want to see happen in and through your life? So again, I want to ask you this question. What do you want to talk to God about? Are your prayers just consumed with the things that people who don't even believe in God pray about? Or is there something that's so heavy on your heart the minute you start praying about it, you're praying, God, if you don't, it won't. God, if you don't show up, God, if you don't do something, this isn't going to happen. God, I'm not going away because this is big, and God, I need you to do this. Do you, have, do you have something that you pray about that when you pray about it, it's emotional because it's so important to you? What do you want to talk to God about? And if nothing comes to mind, if you can't think of anything, in case you're wondering where we're going for the rest of our time together this morning, maybe you've got to leave early, or maybe you didn't plan to come to this service, or maybe you're falling asleep because of time change, and if that's you, just tell the person next to you you're praying, or you know, if you're texting or you're wondering where you're going to go for lunch, listen, what we're going to talk about for the rest of our time together this morning, what I'm hoping that will happen for you at the end of this service is that you will commit, you will commit to pray for two things. And that you will make a decision today that you are going to be relentless in your prayers over those two things until you see God do something or you see God move. And what we're going to discover this morning is that God is both bothered by that. Yes, you heard me right. God is both bothered by that and God is honored by that. Do you pray about anything that honors his size and his magnitude? Or do you just pray about things that, if you're honest, they're just going to work out some way anyways? Do you pray about things that people who don't even believe in God pray about? I mean, what would it look like for you to talk to God about something that would actually need or require his intervention for something to happen? What do you want to talk to God about? That something that would need or require his intervention. If you're a family that prays together, if you're a family that prays together, what are you praying together about as a family? 
Parents, this is important. Do you, do you realize this? That the size of your prayers is what communicates the size of your God to your children? The size of your prayers is what communicates the size of your God to your children. Is their God no bigger than a test? Is their God no bigger than grace before a meal? Is their God no bigger than give us safety as we travel or help me to get over this sickness? Is their God just a date-sized God or an appointment-sized God? Or do you invite them to see how big God is by talking about something as a family and then saying, okay, we're going to talk to God about this together and we're going to watch and we're going to see what he does. What do you want to talk to God about? And if nothing comes to your mind right now, in fact, one of the things that, I mean, this is just a personal pet peeve, and, um, you know, we're all friends here, right, and it's early, we can be, we can be honest, what, what happens this morning stays here this morning, we, we good with that? So, right, we, we, but we got those things, and, and we have some, you know, personal pet peeves, and if you're visiting with us this morning, or if you're, you're new to church, you're not sure what you believe, I hope you never experience this, because this is something that, you know, as Christians, and I've got to be honest, I'm, I'm the worst at this, and we're, we're, as Christians, we're terrible about this, but we get together, and we share prayer requests, and, and, and this is just, I mean, if you've been a Christian for more than 20 minutes, you've had this happen to some degree or another, but you're sitting with a group of people, maybe in a small group, and you're sitting in a circle, and someone, maybe the group leader says, does anybody have any prayer requests? And you look around the room, and everybody's like, and then somebody goes, oh, I've got one, and you're like, eh, can't pray for that, because if it took you three minutes to think it up, it's obviously not that important to you, right? I mean, when something's hanging over your heart and hanging over your head, you don't, you know, and it's big and you got to see God do it, you don't have to go, you know, let me ask you to pray for something that I'm not even praying about, but I had to think something up for the prayer time. I mean, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about something that's so important, it's intimidating, something that matters so much to you, the, you're actually almost afraid to pray about it. Because if you pray about it and nothing happens, you're afraid you're going to have to defend God to somebody. I'm talking about something that just wrenches you out of the way that you've been praying most of your life. Something that twists your faith to the point that you're not even sure if you should keep asking. Do you know that's the way Jesus told us to pray? That's how Jesus told us to pray. One day he was with his disciples and they came to him and they said, Jesus, would you teach us how to pray? Which is interesting because they'd been praying all their lives. They were good Jewish boys. They'd grown up praying. They'd memorized prayers. They'd been to synagogue. They'd been to Jerusalem. They'd been to the temple. They've heard important people pray public prayers. And yet they watch Jesus and they realize he does it differently. I mean, we pray, he prays, he does it different. And so they said to Jesus, would you teach us how to pray. And what's fascinating about what we're going to look at this morning is that in this moment, Jesus could have said anything he wanted to about prayer. Anything he wanted to. I mean, this is your big chance, Jesus. Tell us about prayer. And what Jesus chooses to focus on in this moment is just, it's so bizarre. I mean, these are the verses that you read and you're like, this has got to be true because nobody would make this up. What we're going to read this morning makes God look so bad. And Jesus chooses to focus on this, and it's baffling, it's unique, and I hope what we're about to re read rattles you, because it rattles me. And we're going to pick it up in the book of Luke, chapter 11, and here's what it says. One day, Jesus was praying in a certain place. Remember, certain place, time and a place, time and a place. Jesus said, go in your room and close the door. When he finished, when he finished praying, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. In other words, Jesus, we're watching you, and... We don't think we're doing this thing right. Would you, would you teach us how to pray like you pray? And so Jesus said, this is what he said. He said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. And he continues on. And he says, forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. And some of you are thinking, that's not exactly how it goes. It's our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And that's because you memorized the Matthew version that we looked at last week. Two different situations. Jesus didn't pray the same way every time. He didn't even say the Lord's prayer right half the time. Because Jesus knew that the point of prayer wasn't to say the same thing over and over and over and over again. Jesus showed us that the point of prayer is to do three things. We talked about it last week. It's to declare God's greatness, to surrender your will, and to acknowledge your dependence. 
you, ign- you declare God's greatness. God, you are amazing. You are awesome. I'm just in, in awe of who you are. How majestic is your name? You know, you are incredible, God. And because I recognize who, who you are, I want to surrender my will for your will. Your kingdom come. Your will be done in my life as it is in heaven. And because of all that, God, I just I acknowledge how dependent I, I am on you. I am so dependent on you for provision, for pardon from sin, for protection. God, I am so dependent on you for everything. Jesus said, this is how you pray. And from time to time, it'll sound different. From time to time, you'll focus on different aspects of this to varying degrees. But this is the point of prayer. But Jesus doesn't stop here in Luke chapter 11. He continues to teach about prayer. And what he says next is mind-boggling. It's absolutely mind-boggling. Then Jesus said to them, Suppose you have a friend, and you go to him at midnight, and you say, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread for a friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have no food to offer him. So the disciples know immediately, okay, Jesus is telling us one of his made-up stories to make a point, so pay attention because these are really hard to follow. And Jesus starts talking. He says, okay, here's the situation. You got a friend who goes to another friend at midnight, and, and he goes there, and he's banging on the door, and he says, hey, can you, I, can you get me some food? I don't have any food at my house, and I've had some unexpected guests. Could you help me out? And the disciples are listening to this thinking, man, there's no way I would get up out of bed. There's no way I would help this guy. And you'd think the same thing if you understood how they slept back then. In fact, in the Middle East, many homes still do this today. They, they would have one room where all the men slept, and they'd have another room where all the women slept, and in some cases, they only had one room where everybody slept, and they slept in rows covered in blankets to keep one another warm. And it wasn't one of those things that you could stay up late after everybody else went to bed. I mean, everybody went to bed at the same time. Everybody got up at the same time. There was none of this, you know, tiptoeing in the dark, you know, trying to be quiet. I mean, if you got up, everybody got up. And so Jesus is telling this story, okay, here, here's this guy, and he's banging on the door in the middle of the night, hey, 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 I got some friends that came over, can you help me, I need some bread, I need something to eat, and the guy's in there going, are you kidding me? It's in the middle of the night, everybody's asleep, my wife is snoring, if I get up and help you, everybody's got to get up, you, if you keep banging on my door, you are going to wake up my entire household. And Jesus continues on in his story, and he says, and suppose the one inside answers, don't bother me. The door is already locked and my children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. And if, when you read a parable and the disciples had heard enough of Jesus' stories to recognize, okay, this is a parable, this is a made-up story, it's not a true story, Jesus is telling this story to make a point. And when he does this, they knew this, when they do this, somebody in this story represents us and someone in this story represents God the Father. Now, who's who in this story. Like, well, we're talking about prayer, and so the person that represents us probably is the guy that's banging on the door asking for the bread because he's asking for something that's kind of like a prayer. So that means that the person that represents God is the guy who's asleep and says, don't bother me. I don't want to get up. I don't know that that's the God that I want to pray to. You know, don't bother me. I'm asleep. But you felt that way sometimes when you pray, haven't you? Haven't you? You feel like I shouldn't bother God or I'm bothering God by asking about this or, or sometimes I feel like God is asleep when I pray because nothing happened. And Jesus introduces God the Father as someone who's asleep and says, don't bother me. He can't be bothered to get up and help somebody that he considers to be a friend. And Jesus goes on, he says, I tell you, though he will not get up and give him the bread because he is his friend, yet because of the man's boldness, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. And so Jesus is saying, look, this guy isn't going to get up and, and help this guy out because he's his friend. The only thing, Jesus said, the only thing that's going to get this guy up out of bed and cause him to disturb his entire family is not the need. It's because this guy won't go away. And this translation translates that word boldness. Other translations uh, translate that same word into persistence or shameless persistence. In other words, it's this guy isn't going away. He's bold. He's banging on that door. Hey, I know you're in there. I know you're in there. I know you're in there. I see you through the crack. Don't you dare ignore me. I see you in there. Hey, I need some bread. You got to help me. What? It's his boldness. 
It's his shamelessness. It's his persistence. It's his inappropriateness that's what's going to cause this guy to get up, disturb his family, wake them all up, go find the bread, go to the door, unlock the door, hand the guy the bread and say, here you go. It's not because this guy is his friend. It's not even because of his need. It's because this guy is bold. He's persistent. It's because of his shameless asking. And the disciples are like, surely God's not like that. And Jesus said, you asked about prayer. I'm telling you, sometimes God's going to be like a guy who doesn't want to do anything for you, and you're going to have to talk him into it. And in fact, later on in this same book, Jesus doubles down on this description of God. In chapter 18, he tells another parable, and this one is about an unjust, wicked judge and a widow. A widow who's lost her husband and has a kid and and Jesus is telling this story and she's desperately in need of this help from this judge and so she goes to this judge over and over and over again for help and he doesn't want to be bothered by her. And so he's like, oh, get out of my hair. I can't, I don't, can't be bothered with you. Just leave me alone. Go away, go away, go away. And Jesus says this woman keeps coming after him over and over and over again, begging for help, begging for help, begging for help. And finally, the judge is like, ugh, just to get this woman out of my hair, I'm going to help her. And Jesus introduces that parable with these words in Luke 18. It says, then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. So Jesus presents God the Father as an unjust judge who's like, all right, just just leave me alone already. Jesus presents God the Father as a guy who's asleep and is like, oh, just to get you out of the neighborhood, I'll get up and give you some bread. And the disciples are going, I'm sorry, we asked, right? Like the way we pray is a lot more polite. The way we pray is a lot more honoring to God. It's a lot more tame. It's a lot more reverent. You're talking about, you know, begging and pleading and knocking on doors as if God is reluctant to do anything. And Jesus says, that's how it is. That's how it is. And so I say to you, he says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. And he gives us three words, not because they're three different things, but because he's trying to emphasize a point. You have to keep asking. You have to keep seeking. You have to keep knocking. Ask, seek, knock. Ask, seek, knock. Ask, seek, knock. Dial, 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 dial. You just keep coming after God until God finally gives in and does what it is you're asking him to do. And if that makes you uncomfortable, I get it. Because most of us, if not all of us, did not grow up hearing prayers like that. Did we? And yet when you read through the scriptures, you see great heroes of the faith that came after God. Abraham came after God. Moses, David, Isaiah, they came after God and they said things like, you better not ignore me, God. Hey, God, I need your attention. God, you gotta do this. God, you need to do this. God, you promised. You better not go back on your word. And other people said to these guys, look, you can't talk to God like that. And yet God honored their persistence and God honored their prayers and they were not turned off because God didn't open the door for them immediately. Do you pray like that? Most Christians don't. Is it any wonder we have so little to talk about? Is it any wonder so little happens in so many of our lives? Is it any wonder so little happens in so many churches? Let me ask you again. What do you want to talk to God about? And here's... Here's a crazy mind bender for you this morning, for some of you, not for all of you, but for some of you. There are some of you hearing me ask that question of you this morning. There are some of you sitting here right now. There are some of you watching or listening online right now hearing me ask that question, what do you want to talk to God about? Because you were the answer to that question for somebody else. 
you were the answer to this question for somebody else. And what has you here this morning, what has you watching, what has you listening right now is not that situation. It's not that circumstance that happened in your life that has you seeking or questioning life or asking big questions. What has you here listening to that question this morning is because someone, whether it was your mom or your dad or your grandparents, somebody stayed on the line with God talking to God about you. And you are here today because after who knows how long God did something about what they were praying about. And what they were praying about was you. So why would you spend such a significant amount of your time talking to God about something that without him would probably work out in some way anyway? What is it in your life? What is it on your mind? What is it that's in your heart that's going to keep you coming back Asking, seeking, knocking, asking, seeking, knocking, dialing, dialing, dialing. What is it? What is it beyond, am I going to get over the flu, and and is this deal going to close, and is she going to call me back, and what's going to happen with this, or what's going to happen with that? Isn't there something bigger in your life? Isn't there something grander in your life? Isn't there something more you want to see happen in and through your life? What's going to keep you asking, seeking, and knocking? What is that? And if you don't know, that's okay. Start there. Go in your room today. Close the door and say, God, would you put a burden on my heart for something or for someone that weighs me down emotionally to the point where someone says, hey, are there any prayer requests? My hand goes up before they even finish the sentence. And it may take 10 weeks, 10 months, 10 years for anything to happen. But would you begin to honor and bother your heavenly father with the size of your prayers? That's how Jesus told us to pray. And when you begin to pray that way, your eyes will get bigger. And your heart will get bigger. And your God will get bigger.